So in today's webinar, we're going to take a look at the market uh, year to date and how it's been performing. We'll also take a look at uh, some ideas for categorizing your current holdings when you're evaluating them to think about what you're buying and selling and holding in your existing portfolio. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with the discussion of a different type of security that we don't usually focus on in the better investing uh, methodology. But we'll be taking a look at that uh, as part of our educational focus and leave you with some investment ideas uh, at the end of our presentation. So where do we stand uh, in this crazy 2020 year? Well, here is our market performance year to date for the S&P 500, uh, which is now up 8% for the year, uh, even though it's uh, seen the last week or so, we've seen uh, a significant sell-off. The EFA, which is the Europe, Australasia, Far East Index, that's the index of large cap stocks in developed countries around the world, is down just 4% for the year. And it's actually uh, held its own during the US sell-off of the last week. And then finally, the S&P small cap 600 uh, is down 11% for the year, still has not recovered uh, to the highs that it reached earlier in 2020. Uh, the, uh, we're slightly off the, uh, the highs that were set uh, back in March, uh, and then the new highs, of course, that we reached uh, earlier in September, late August, as the S&P 500 kind of surged ahead. Uh, just a crazy year, as this graph would indicate. Uh, our recession is still underway, and that's holding back, I think, especially the smaller cap stocks and concerns uh, across the global economy with reference to the pandemic, I think, is holding back stocks around the world to some degree. But investors don't tend to be too scared off by securities right now. The S&P 500's P.E. ratio on an estimated trailing 12-month basis is uh, just uh, under 29 at 28.72. Um, so that is uh, pretty much exactly where we were last month when we looked at the, um, uh, at the P.E. ratio of the market. Uh, I think that, again, there's uh, so many factors that are keeping investors in the stock market uh, that are looking that to uh, uh, prevent stocks from kind of selling off and investors are holding on uh, in large, uh, large, largely uh, to the stocks that they're holding. So, uh, and again, that 28 uh, PE would have been inconceivable uh, any time before the 1990s uh, when the market did not uh, reach anywhere near that level of valuation. The earnings of the S&P 500 uh, are up slightly on a trailing 12-month basis um, using estimated earnings. Uh, so that includes companies that haven't yet reported what are the estimates for their uh, their their the last four quarters. Uh, so that's up slightly, even though we're off the highs as we would expect. Uh, a lot of companies still uh, showing losses or showing earnings declines. Uh, so, uh, but so far not anywhere near the earnings declines that we saw in 2008 2009, uh, as referenced on this graph. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of companies continue to perform well, and we'll talk about that uh, split in the market uh, in just uh, just a little while. Uh, well, in fact, right now, uh, your current stock portfolio, as I've been looking at uh, the market and the economy uh, and looking at the different types of companies, uh, I've really come to crystallize a viewpoint uh, that's supported by advocates of the K-shaped recovery, uh, which is, is to say that some companies are going to be the, uh, the upward stretching arm of the letter K. They're going to be performing very well. Um, they've been performing well. Um, they are not that affected by the pandemic or the pandemic trends have influenced them for the better. Uh, and then the bottom uh, uh, direction uh, of the letter K are those companies that are going to be suffering for some time. So that V-shaped recovery that was often uh, uh, often talked about uh, seems to be uh, stretching out into a, you know, an U or an L or into this sort of K-shaped recovery. And I do like this, the K-shaped, uh, the metaphor or descriptor, uh, because there are certainly a number of companies that have been performing very well. If we look at... Uh, 
2020. Um, certainly, the markets, uh, big moves, big declines, uh, and the pandemic uh, have shocked the economy. So we've got a double whammy for a lot of companies where uh, if uh, a lot of people are unemployed, a lot of companies are not going to be performing well because consumers aren't spending. Um, and uh, so they, they typically, those types of businesses don't fare well during a recession. Um, likewise, uh, the pandemic has impacted um, certain other industries and sectors and companies and certainly has exacerbated the problem with some companies. And so we end up with a situation where not all companies and industries are affected as they would be in a more traditional uh, type of recession or the recessions that we've experienced in the past. So I think it's worth looking at your portfolio, especially as the third quarter results start to come in um, next month uh, to look at the underperformers and outperformers and uh, to think about making some small tactical shifts where we're, our strategy remains uh, uh, being fully invested in securities with a long-term view. But I think that many investors could benefit from making some small tactical moderate, uh, uh, alterations to that strategy. Uh, again, too much tinkering is not uh, is not very useful. Uh, too much monitoring uh, will drive you crazy. Uh, but I think that uh, taking a look at your current holdings with some of these themes in mind can be useful, uh, especially as you look at new companies that you might consider adding to your portfolio. Um, I've ca roughly categorized stocks into one of four different categories. The first is they're running business as usual. Um, the second is their beneficiaries of these unusual times. The third is the slow recoverers. And the fourth are the wild cards for which uh, all bets are off. And it can be very difficult to foresee uh, when these companies might be recovering and when they might uh, or how long it might take uh, if they ever do. Uh, so that first category, running business as usual, there are a lot of companies that are performing uh, relatively well on a fundamental basis. And again, we're talking about fundamentals, so the stock price is separate from that. Uh, but we do recognize that over the longer term, if a company does well fundamentally, it'll see its price go up. So we've seen um, uh, the companies in the sensitive or the defensive super sectors uh, doing quite well uh, in 2020, sometimes reaching new heights, uh, such as Apple reaching uh, you know, new records of market capitalization, uh, other companies um, just having a banner year so far uh, and uh, doing, doing very well, mostly. Uh, these are large tech stocks, which seem to have been holding their own. Uh, those that were might have been more adversely affected by a slowdown in international trade or uh, sourcing of parts for China because of the, uh, the, the China tariffs and the trade war uh, that played out in 2017 and 2018. I think a lot of those companies had uh, adjusted their businesses. So when the pandemic arrived and that further influenced trade um, and restricted exports from China coming to the, or delayed uh, exports coming from China, they had already made adjustments and could uh, further accommodate um, that disruption to the supply chain. Uh, other uh, companies that have done well, grocery stores and discount stores, they will perform well during recessions uh, and uh, during the pandemic as well. Um, people need to eat. Uh, and if they weren't going out to eat, uh, they were ordering in food or going to the grocery store or the big box uh, department stores and discount stores and, and buying food. Uh, and so a lot of those companies, even with restricted hours, uh, performed well during the peak of the pandemic. Uh, and I would expect continued to. Um, telecommunications companies as well as, as uh, consumers uh, still needed to be connected and perhaps uh, be connected in different ways, uh, such as having a, a more robust connection in their home to access Wi-Fi and the internet. Uh, and uh, their company's uh, uh, servers and VPNs. So I think telecom is, has done okay. Fast food companies, again, have been able to pivot uh, to uh, uh, a delivery mode and a drive-through mode. Uh, so many still have their dining rooms closed down, but sales remain robust. Uh, some, one exception to that is uh, that the breakfast trade has often fallen off at many fast food restaurants because 
no one's driving to work anymore. So no one's stopping to get a cup of coffee or a bagel or a donut or a breakfast sandwich uh, on their way to the office. Uh, and so uh, that has uh, perhaps been something of a downturn, uh, but there are even indications from some of the major fast food chains that they've released new blueprints for re local restaurants uh, and remodeling that add drive through lanes and facilitate a more mobile uh, ordering source as opposed to larger in restaurant dining rooms. Uh, so a lot of those companies are, are pivoting and uh, many of them are, have been remodeling and, and moving ahead uh, in that direction. Certainly IT services, uh, and utilities uh, are holding their own for sure. And these, I would consider all these to be good current holds. Uh, stocks that have held up so far in 2020 are probably all, all doing something right that will provide some further support, uh, even if the pandemic, as it appears now, will continue through 2021, at least until next fall, uh, by some estimations, uh, till we see uh, some letting up and uh, some resumption of more normal trends. Uh, and uh, to that end, uh, what normal is, I think is up for grabs. Uh, there, we could have that new normal um, that uh, where we see the lingering effects of the pandemic uh, going on for many, many years as people alter their behavior uh, accordingly uh, by, uh, by, you know, perhaps not eating out or being quite as social as they used to be, uh, as they, uh, as many more companies embrace work from home as a means of uh, recognizing employer, employee productivity remains high while uh, they can reduce their real estate costs, uh, you know, and, and uh, facility costs. So there are uh, lots of longer term effects that I think remain to be seen. But so these business as usual companies, uh, these are the, the should be the mainstays of your portfolio right now. And as I mentioned, they're often larger companies. Um, there are a lot of beneficiaries of these unusual times. Um, and these are, are companies that tend to have unique features that pr provide support to businesses and uh, uh, as well as to individuals and provide benefits uh, that are of in demand during uh, the current uh, uh, economic and health crisis. Pharmaceuticals, biotech stocks, uh, you know, again, at the forefront. And I don't suggest trying to chase down which company is gonna have a vaccine or treatment uh, before others, but uh, by and large, uh, pharmaceuticals and biotech stocks perform well during recessions. They continue to hold up because their revenue is not, is not by and large uh, generated by discretionary uh, accounts. It's, it's paid for by insurance companies. It's part of employee benefits so they continue on. Um, and so uh, Medicare, Medicaid, certainly providing support for many of the treatments. Uh, and drugs that are being uh, provided. Uh, RVs and home builders are sort of a surprise beneficiary of unusual times. Um, during recessions, we would expect that RV sales would decline and home building would slow. Uh, but in terms of entry level home building, you've heard me say that talk about uh, country companies like LGI Homes and Century Communities, and there are many others uh, that are making entry, building entry level first time home buyer communities. Uh, those are seeing uh, demand at or above levels um, that they were uh, where they were last year be, because of some of the trends away from urban living of the millennials, the millennial population, which is reaching a particular age anyway, and was already starting to migrate away from urban centers. And uh, as uh, when you're trapped at home uh, for 24 hours a day in an apartment, uh, even if it's a spacious apartment, um, uh, and if you're even if you're lucky enough to have a view, uh, there's something about having a home and a yard and a place to call your own, uh, and uh, uh, not feeling quite so crunched uh, in with your neighbors into uh, high density uh, urban housing. So there actually uh, is bigger demand for those types of businesses, and similarly with RVs, as, as company as individuals and families are are thinking about vacation but shying away from uh, 
traveling by plane or staying in hotels or eating in restaurants a lot, they re realize that with an RV, you can go anywhere, take your kitchen and your hotel room with you. And so companies like Winnebago have seen a big demand in RVs. Um, insurance companies uh, have done very well. Um, and again, kind of counterintuitively, uh, but during the pandemic, uh, a lot of uh, optional healthcare procedures, elective procedures, et cetera, have been deferred. Uh, and so insurance companies haven't had to pay out. And insurance companies have been making refunds to policyholders, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, the month of May when nobody was going to the dentist. Uh, insurance companies were refunding dental insurance. A lot of uh, car insurers were um, uh, making refunds because people are not driving as less. You're driving fewer miles if you're not commuting to work, so you're qualifying for lower mileage discounts. Uh, but uh, that also means if people are driving less, uh, that car insurance uh, is paying out less because there are fewer accidents. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting studies, um, you know, in the coming decade about the impact of uh, the pandemic on all sorts of uh, societal uh, issues and concerns, including, you know, auto safety, traffic safety. Do we need to spend money to expand our 12 lane highways to 18 lane highways? Maybe with a more of a work from home mentality, uh, those highways uh, can be more, uh, don't need to be, uh, we don't need to spend money to ex extend them, et cetera. Uh, so insurance companies have been a beneficiary and that might continue. Uh, cloud-based, anything cloud-based, remote workforce solutions, including Zoom, even though you know it's hard to justify on a valuation basis, the uh, the share price, um, it's, it's no surprise that they are uh, grabbing market share and uh, uh, from larger, more established companies, uh, GoToWebinar uh, just recently and GoToMeeting just recently went uh, and their parent company logged me in, uh, were taken private. Um, so they were initially spun off from Citrix and merged and then uh, now they're a standalone private business and no longer publicly traded. Uh, but again, they've uh, been busy. Um, WebEx has a, uh, a, a, pro a program as well from Citrix. So those, those solutions, uh, as well as uh, remote storage and remote applications, uh, all been big beneficiaries. You know, it's not clear how much growth there is in the future for them if they sort of plateaued or if there's one time demand, but uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of companies, as I mentioned before, are going to be evaluating their workforce, and uh, uh, so we might expect to see um, some further growth there. Robotics, uh, you know, one of the companies we follow in our small cap informer makes uh, automated and robotic solutions for food processing, and that's been a big, a big um, um, uh, area of concern in the production of uh, food processed uh, meats, cheeses, dairy, et cetera, uh, and the effect of the, of the pandemic on the food chain has been pretty significant. So I would expect to see further automation coming in that particular industry, and I think uh, as well as others where uh, low-cost labor is being um, utilized right now. Uh, if you're low-cost labor uh, ha in a pandemic, we we're all working close together, um, that can be uh, shut you down entirely. So I think a lot of companies are gonna be looking towards that. So in the, the short to midterm period, I think there are opportunities for these kinds of businesses. Um, and so while we are long-term focused, I like to look at these companies and think about them as good stop caps to get us through uh, the recession and the pandemic uh, by just making uh, and looking out for opportunities um, that uh, we might not otherwise consider, uh, especially smaller companies as we're going there. Uh, the slow recoverers are those companies that may not reach the, the former highs in terms of earnings and revenues and share price for many years into the future. Um, all bets are off at this point. There, I've not seen anyone making any sort of projection as to when uh, Delta and American Airlines and Southwest Air are going to reach uh, 2019 flight levels before. They just, uh, nobody knows. Uh, those are very expensive businesses the airlines uh, run, um, and they've just got carrying costs to pay for the hardware 
the metal that's sitting out on their uh, the tarmacs uh, or now in deep storage. Uh, they've got to pay slot fees at, at airports. Uh, if you don't pay them, you lose them. And then uh, when you need them, you don't have them. So uh, we see you know some uh, lots of lingering after effects in the tra anything related to travel. Cruise lines, airlines, hotels, restaurants, uh, all affected. Uh, and may take several years to see them coming around again. A lot of specialty retail has been um, has been uh, deeply affected. We're continuing to see uh, bankruptcies of old school bricks and mortar retailers uh, as they have just uh, the pandemic just really crushed the foot traffic in stores like J.C. Penney and shopping malls. Anything that's dependent on that experience. So those types of businesses are, are going. Uh, going behind, and it's interesting that Amazon is looking at uh, taking over some of those large spaces held by J.C. Penney's and Sears and Kmart as distribution centers, where they can uh, move in. There's there's not a lot of uh, uh, they're not walls that need to be torn down, uh, so they can kind of convert them relatively easily. They're in geographically uh, attractive areas in terms of deliveries, so they don't have to build big facilities. And so kind of an interesting uh, interesting theme there, um, but uh, definitely an impact on a lot of the specialty retail uh, companies. Theme parks in the same, same boat. Uh, entertainment companies, if you're uh, uh, making film or television shows, uh, again, uh, yep, if it's streaming, that's one thing. If you're counting on uh, putting your movies into the movie theaters, that's something else entirely. And it's going to be uh, a long, uh, long road to hoe for those uh, kinds of companies. Automakers in the same boat, I think. Um, so, so economically sensitive that uh, I think all automakers are feeling the burn. And it, again, think about it. Millions and millions of people not traveling to work every day. How much does that reduce the wear and tear on your vehicle? When are you going to be looking to buy a new car? If you're concerned that you might be, you might lose your job or be laid off, or you were laid off or you were furloughed, are you going to be buying a new car? Probably not as likely. So again, there are a lot of factors that I think will delay that particular uh, recovery in that sector for some time. So many of these stocks may be really, really, really cheap, but the question about timing of recovery, I think puts them into an area of uncertainty that um, I wouldn't be comfortable holding many of those stocks. Uh, even if you're holding them, uh, think about as your end approaches uh, of thinking, you know, are you holding them at a loss? Can you sell that loss and use that to, um, uh, to reduce your capital gains exposure uh, in terms of taxes? <clears throat> It's, this is September, so it's not too soon to start thinking about that. And then finally, the wild cards. There are some companies in sectors that may perform well, um, but they might be very difficult to evaluate. Uh, and they might also have been very beaten down by the market. Financials and energies uh, of energy stocks tend to lead expectations for the third and fourth quarters in terms of uh, uh, price performance, but that's mainly because they've just been hammered so badly um, as we uh, get into the second and third quarter of 2020. Uh, and so it just makes them very tricky to kind of evaluate uh, with interest rates back to being so low that that can be attractive if you need capital. And that's been supporting home buying because you can get mortgages uh, at uh, very low uh, rates, but on the other hand, it makes it much harder though, for the financial stocks to perform. Uh, banks, for instance, to to make uh, a profit uh, because the interest rates are so very low. Uh, uh, likewise, when we look at um, uh, bank stocks or credit companies, credit card companies, uh, when lots of people are unemployed, guess what's happening to their credit card debt? Uh, it's going up and they're not repaying it and the risk of default increases significantly. Uh, so that uh, puts them in a troubled position. Uh, basic materials and industrials tend to be very tricky uh, and you really have to take it on a company by company basis. Uh, during a recession, we would expect some slowdown for most of those companies 
but again, we're just in a weird and wacky market. So um, those companies, uh, you know, I would suggest limiting your exposure and doing uh, com doing uh, in-depth company analysis to kind of figure out where they hold. But those four categories, I think, are really useful in terms of looking at your current holdings. And if you're looking at them, and you're going, gosh, um, six out of 10 stocks in this portfolio are slow recoverers. One is a wild card. Uh, one is running business as usual and the, you know, the remainder beneficiaries of unusual times. Uh, you might ha be sitting on a portfolio that isn't gonna be supported by fundamental trends uh, until we get through the pandemic, uh, until we head out of 2021 this time next year, hopefully if we're lucky. And again, with the winter coming, um, uh, you know, there's just no pre predicting how that's going to impact businesses, um, especially in the northern, in the northeast, uh, in the Midwest, where uh, companies, uh, for instance, restaurants have been able to expand their outdoor service. Uh, once we get into November, that's going to be trickier and trickier to do. It's just going to be colder and colder. Uh, and uh, many people are going to be less interested in eating outside if you've got to wear your parka to do it and if you have to shovel off snow off the table, right? So there are all sorts of, of factors uh, that uh, that could impact and change things up as we head into the winter of this year. Anyway, so those are some, uh, some things to think about as we look at uh, your current portfolio. I wanted to switch gears and talk about uh, gold mining and royalty stocks. A couple of weeks ago, I did a presentation for the Money Show on uh, precious metal mining investing for stock investors uh, who are focused on long term. A lot of the precious metal investing uh, that and goes on is more speculative. There are a lot of, uh, uh, especially in the Canadian markets, Western Canada has a lot of mining operations. Uh, so there's a lot of speculation that goes on. Uh, gold. Uh, the the underlying price of gold has had a terrific uh, terrific year, uh, as it will when uh, the when uh, when people are are, are subjected to uh, economic um, slides, uh, they tend to, to to the price of gold tends to go up as investors uh, look to it as a hedge. Uh, and so the, the question was, is there a way for a long-term focused investor uh, using Better Investing's tools and the Toolkit 6 program to look at some of these kinds of companies uh, and think about adding some exposure to your portfolio? What would the benefits be, uh, et cetera? So from that presentation, I've, I've kind of uh, uh, coalesced some of the thoughts. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to actually look at some of these stocks on the stock selection guide so that you can get some idea about how they perform uh, relative to the analysis that you're doing for other types of companies, what's different, what's what's unique, what uh, are the factors that you should be focused on, at least from my perspective. Uh, when you look at uh, portfolio management recommendations, often uh, there's an asset allocation element to it where uh, your advisor may recommend a certain exposure to bonds, to cash, to real estate, to precious metals. Those are all uh, part of what we call asset allocation. And then equities would be uh, one component of that asset allocation as well. Better investing only focuses on the equity allocation, the stock allocation, and uh, doesn't really teach that al asset allocation is absolutely desirable. It's not a must have. You don't need to be diversified uh, by asset type in a long term focused portfolio. Asset allocation can help, uh, can help hedge the performance and the underperformance and outperformance of different classes so that over time, your portfolio returns can be more consistent. Better Messing's thinking is, well, who cares if at the end of the day, we, have it, we, we end up with more money um, and we just talk about weathering the ups and downs along the way, um, we're still getting to the same place and maybe we're getting to a somewhat higher place by focusing purely on equities. But of course, uh, whenever you've got a particular type of investment that performs well, we see a lot of interest and uh, the recent strength in gold and precious metals have increased interest. So can we as long-term focused stock investors 
uh, add some exposure to this type of asset to our stock portfolio. There are three ways that you can invest in gold and precious metals, and we're going to focus on gold investing. Um, you could also look at silver. You can also look at other types of precious metals, but uh, we're going to focus on gold. That is the dominant uh, precious metal, of course. Uh, one way to invest is in physical coins or bullion. Um, uh, and that is where you actually buy bars of gold or you buy uh, gold coins. Um, if you are investing that way, um, you've got to consider storage because you own the actual gold. You got to keep it protected somewhere. Um, protected from theft, protected from, um, you know, a fire isn't going to hurt it as much, uh, but are you going to, if you uh, bury it in the woods, you got to remember where it is, otherwise you've got a problem, or you got to pay a storage facility, so there are additional fees there. Uh, when you buy the asset, there may be commissions, dealer fees that you have to pay as well, and taxes. Uh, and uh, the tax concerns are considerable because they're considered collectibles, so you have to file different tax forms. They're not subject to the same tax rules as stocks. And that's very significant. They're taxed differently, and they require additional reporting on your annual tax returns. So those uh, elements uh, require some uh, additional uh, considerations before you take it on. Certainly ETFs and options on ETFs are another way that you can invest. So ETFs are an easy way. Um, there are many ETFs. Uh, you can uh, buy ETF uh, that will hold a couple dozen different gold mining stocks. So they do the work on uh, tracking the index um, and then uh, you pay uh, a very minimal expense ratio when you buy those ETFs and you can invest that way. Uh, and many of them are optionable. So there are strategies where you can use uh, calls and puts and you can hedge and if the price goes up you sell if it goes down you you know you exercise the rights etc uh, so uh, if you love uh, options um, that might be something you could take a look at and the third way to invest in gold is through mining and royalty stocks so there's two different types of companies there these are often the easiest way and when you invest in a mining stock um, it's treated like a security so you don't have to worry about um, the uh, the tax headaches or the tax considerations of holding the underlying asset. Uh, and uh, it's so much more liquid than if you want to sell your gold, you've got to go find a buyer. If you want to sell your mining stock, you just click on your broker's website and uh, the transaction is done. So uh, that's what we're gonna focus on in this presentation. There are two types of companies uh, that are available as gold mining stocks. One is the actual mining companies themselves. Uh, we call them the gold miners. These are operators of mines. Uh, and the second type is the streaming or ro and royalty company. They provide cash up front, so they invest in, they buy a share of a mine, and in, in the end of it, they get either uh, the right to buy a certain amount of the gold that's being output at below market prices, a particular discount, or they receive a percentage of the output outright. Uh, and so uh, both of these types of companies are available to you as investors. Uh, the gold miners, um, this is, still provides you with a hedge against uh, the equity portion of your portfolio because uh, it's going to be more correlated to the price of gold. Uh, and that is a good hedge against economic downturns. Uh, when the economy uh, is heading down, gold is heading up in price. So, uh, and while that correlation is strong, uh, the other aspect of the business is that you've got it, they are responsible for getting the gold out of the ground. So the business of mining has to be considered and just with any business, there are good businesses, there are bad businesses, there are businesses that struggle, there are businesses that are successful, there are businesses that are in startup phase, there are businesses that are well-established uh, and it makes a difference as to how profitably the gold can be extracted. Um, we'll talk more about some of the, the aspects of the gold miners as well. Um, it's easy to buy any brokerage firm. Many of them pay dividends, so uh, that can be a benefit um, because they're taxed as securities. You don't need extra tax forms. They're very liquid, uh, and ETFs are available for these as well. If at the end of this you go, well, uh, I get what you're saying, Doug, but I don't want to hold them, set aside 5% of your portfolio and buy an ETF. Um, and again, 
that this is a great use of ETFs in a stock portfolio. Uh, so uh, that's your personal preference. Um, when we look at gold mining stocks versus the S&P 500, this is the Vanek Vectors Gold Miners ETF, uh, ticker is GDX. That's one of the leading uh, low cost ETFs of gold mining stocks. Uh, and in it, it's the, uh, the line in gold, see what I did there? Uh, and the S&P 500 is in blue. Uh, so over the last, uh, since 2006, which is when the Vanek Vectors uh, Gold ETF start, started, uh, it's up a cumulative 6%. Um, you can see that when the market kind of tanked uh, in 2008, uh, the ETF also tanked, but it recovered much faster as it was apparent that a recession was upon us. Uh, and then it peaked. And as the economy recovered, then that uh, ETF drifted back down and has been vacillating ever since 2013 uh, until 2020, uh, because during uh, times of strife, uh, gold mining becomes much more interesting. So uh, has had a very, very good year uh, so far. But the S&P 500 is up 161% over uh, since uh, 2006. But when we look at the year to date, huh, S&P 500 up about 3.3% year to date, while the uh, Vanek Vectors Gold Miners ETF is up 40.6%. Uh, and uh, again, as we talk about, and you'll keep hearing this theme, when investors are concerned, confused, worried, when the economy is not doing well, gold prices tend to go up. Uh, and so the price of gold mining stocks goes up. And so uh, we've seen a situation this year where, um, you know, uh, it, when t things go badly in the market or in the economy, um, that's a great time to start thinking about buying uh, gold miner ETFs uh, because of that tendency uh, that you're looking at right now. Uh, and again, uh, we don't know where from this point going forward how these ETFs will con this ETF will, will and the gold mining segment will continue to perform. But I think we can all agree that the area, uh, the time of uncertainty is far from being over. Um, and that might lead credence to a, a hypothesis that investing in gold mining stocks uh, could be a reasonable thing to consider right now. So I mentioned the, the business of mining, that's really uh, key. Um, if you think about the business of mining, um, that will give you some insight that will help you with your analysis, I think. Now, the miners make money uh, based on their cost to mine versus what they can sell the gold for, uh, right? So um, uh, that uh, really brings into focus the need to be a low cost provider, to have a, a higher profit margin uh, relative to your peers. If you can get the gold out more cheaply, when prices go up, you're gonna make more money. Uh, but the problem is around the world, the easy gold has already been mined. Uh, if it was easy to get to, somebody found it, it's no longer there. So what, what's left is the gold that is hard to mine. And certainly technology helps uh, improve yields, but mines get deeper, bigger, um, and more difficult to extract the gold uh, from the minerals that it's embedded in uh, deep below the ground. Now the price fluctuations of gold, uh, gold goes up, gold goes down. Uh, and so over time uh, that can really mess with the profitability of your mining operation. Um, so there's high business risk. Uh, so consider you had a great year, you extracted a whole lot of gold, but gold is selling at a, at a historically low price. So now you've got gold that you can't get maximum dollar for. So uh, likewise, maybe in a, in a big year where gold is up significantly, um, you are limited by how much you can max, uh, maximize your production, how much you can get out to sell at that higher price, right? And so you've got two concerns here uh, that are constantly filling in the business. Um, so business risk, uh, is very high in gold miners, which is why uh, if we you do a screen over at My Stock Prospector or Stock Central and look at this particular industry, you will find a whole lot of companies that are not making any money at all. Uh, and so in the business, they call it the all-in sustaining costs, uh, the AISC. Uh, and that those are the costs that uh, uh, that it costs you to, to run your business over the over the years. 
And those costs can be higher than the cost of gold for many years. If that goes on, then you're gonna have to file for bankruptcy. Um, so as a result, many gold miners hedge exposures to the gold price risk in derivative markets, right? So they use derivatives just like um, uh, an airline might buy uh, options to buy jet fuel uh, so that if prices go up, they have an option to buy it at a lower price. If jet fuel prices go down, they don't have to uh, exercise the options. So it's an expense, but it protects them if prices go up. So similarly, gold miners are, will, will uh, hedge their exposure uh, to gold, uh, and uh, that will uh, can help them uh, maintain solvency even during difficult times. Um, gold miners have a reputation for being recklessly managed, but I think some of the ones that I've identified are, don't have those types of problems, uh, and so that will make it a little uh, easier to do some analysis. So when you're looking at gold miners, certainly you want you can consider some of the things that are not on the stock selection guide, um, and some of them are. Uh, one is what are their proven reserves and their extraction plan? Uh, they they might say they control a certain number of acres of, of gold mines in a certain number of countries. Um, if some of those are under producers or haven't yet been tested, that's not really as relevant. Um, so again, history will tell us it, had they been able to extract gold at reasonable levels uh, from the mines that they do operate. Sound management, again, we wanna know who these people are who are running the business and uh, how well they're doing. Uh, and the cost controls are really key. So we wanna be focused on the uh, profit margins of these businesses over time. Uh, and so all the companies that I pulled out to, cons to look at all have five-year average pre-tax profit margins that are higher than the industry average. And so, again, that's gonna be a key consideration. Uh, and uh, how much debt do they have? And again, uh, these companies that I, that I selected, uh, I looked for companies that had minimal amounts of debt. Uh, again, debt is part of the business plan for many of these companies because in order to pull uh, um, gold out of the ground, you have to own the ground or the rights to mine the ground, uh, and that takes capital. Uh, and then you need a lot of big equipment uh, and that takes capital. So it's not uncommon for these companies to have debt. Uh, and they also, because of the all-in sustaining costs, uh, they might need to have a couple of years of extraction underway and building out their business while gold prices are low. Uh, so again, uh, they will finance those years with debt as well. So um, uh, the lower the debt, again, um, the better able they are might or are likely to be to withstand uh, if there was a sudden drop in gold in demand for gold uh, and uh, they'll be able to sustain, sustain themselves through those periods um, now the royalty companies are the companies that invest in these gold miners uh, and then uh, are available as public stocks uh, there if you think of them they're almost like mini mutual funds themselves um, so uh, but one thing that you can do is you can look at some of those royalty companies. They might talk about, we own property in this mine, this mine, and this mine, uh, and this mine. And then they've done the research and figured out that these are their, their best opportunities uh, to get a return on their own investment. Maybe one of those four uh, companies that they invest in uh, will be a great individual uh, stock my gold miner for us to uh, invest in on our own. Uh, so uh, we can lean on those royalty companies in many cases uh, to provide some advantage for our personal portfolios. So some things to, to avoid, certainly early stage exploration companies or single, single asset companies, single companies that operate a single gold mine don't have the diversification, but one that might have one in Canada, one in uh, Africa, one in um, somewhere in the mid, mid uh, uh, the middle uh, and the Far East, uh, you know, those types of companies have geographic diversification, which will help with some of the, uh, the concerns about the business. Uh, companies that are exposed to excessive political risk, you know, if they're mining in Russia or Venezuela, I mean, that should be a big red flag. There, there, here's a potential for problems from the, in the geopolitical 
uh, scheme of things. Um, excessive safety risk. South Africa came up on my research. Um, the mines there are very, very, very deep. And so that increased the risk uh, surrounding that type of uh, uh, operation. And so uh, we might want to stay away from those particular types of companies that are operating mines that are, that are very, very deep. So just some things to, to look out for. Uh, in the royalty companies, um, when we're looking at those, again, if they've got a broad portfolio, that can be good. Um, and uh, keep in mind, even if the mining stock, the mining company itself uh, goes out of business that a royalty company might own, uh, or they go bankrupt, they don't go out of business. They file for bankruptcy. So if you hold shares in that mining stock, uh, you lose. You, your investment is worthless. However, they might continue to make production and pay royalties to the royalty company that has invested in them. So again, that's uh, kind of an interesting um, uh, way to protect yourself uh, from the uh, from the the the. the the turmoil in the mining business as a whole. Uh, ask is the company purchased shares of production? Um, if they've actually purchased shares of production, that can be a good sign because it means they've confirmed the quality and the cost. So they're getting a share of what's coming out of it um, that they expect to be able to sell at a profit. And do they pay a dividend? Those are key considerations when you're looking at the, um, the royalty companies in particular. So in terms of the portfolio diversification, <clears throat> if, if this kind of makes sense to you, you know, a 5% target would not be unreasonable, I think, in my mind, uh, to invest in gold precious metals. It might be a little higher depending on, you know, your preference and what you were attempting to hedge, uh, what type of risk you were attempting to hedge in your stock portfolio. But I think it's important uh, to buy and hold and, and not where I'm not at all suggesting trying to time the buys and the sells. Uh, and because of this non-correlation with stocks, um, gold mining stocks are going to provide, uh, uh, have, the, have the, uh, a good opportunity to provide a benefit to offset declines when the market's going down or the recessions. Um, if you look back at the uh, year-to-date uh, performance of the uh, VanEck ETF versus the goal, uh, the S&P 500, uh, when the market tanked, as soon as the market tanked, that's when the VanEck ETF took off. Uh, so yeah, there might be something to be said for when buy on the dip, uh, when the market goes down, buy gold stocks um, because of that non-correlation. But I think it's better by and large and certainly simpler to implement uh, by establishing a target percentage investing in it um, whether you buy all at once or build up over time and then just letting that that uh, uh, that uh, gold uh, those that gold exposure sit there as a hedge to the rest of your portfolio uh, and kind of smooth out returns for you now we're going to look at the stock selection guide for these companies uh, but i want to warn you you're going to see um, a little bit of annual variation in revenues, but often many of these, just like all companies, they've got more consistent revenues. Um, but the, the problem is the, the, the earnings are all over the map. They go from loss to gain, uh, and uh, they might have extended period periods where they're, they're showing losses, uh, and then they have a great year. And again, it has to do a lot with their costs and the cost of gold. So there's two factors there. They can only control one of those factors, which is their costs of mining. They can't um, uh, affect the price of gold. So we gotta get a, kind of have to give these companies a pass uh, and say, yeah, well, if gold is really depressed in price. Then uh, these companies are gonna, you know, they're gonna be continuing to output. Uh, but they'll really see the benefit when gold prices go back up again. Uh, you might not be able to find analyst estimates. Uh, you, you might even get to the point where you decide that revenue and growth projections uh, are impossible, difficult, or irrelevant. Uh, so we really, we don't even look at the, you might not even decide to look at the quarter to quarter or year to year, uh, but really focus on longer term periods uh, for these particular kinds of companies. Again, they're the anti-stock component of your portfolio. So we need to address them that way. So uh, I did some research, uh, went to our My Stock Prospector website, looked at the gold mining industry, the gold industry uh, as part of basic materials. 
uh, and then sorted and screened and ranked companies. And uh, in the end, I came up with seven stocks, seven gold miners and royalty companies that I thought looked interesting. Um, three of the seven are royalty companies and they're marked with the asterisks one and the remaining four are operating companies uh, and at the top are the uh, mar uh, the revenue weighted industry averages uh, for all of the companies in the gold industry uh, as well uh, uh, so going across so you can see the average industry average in terms of sales was 9.3 billion dollars uh, none of the companies that I pulled out had revenues that were that high uh, or anywhere close to it. Um, the largest uh, miner on my list had sales last year of $1.38 billion. Um, some of them were, were much smaller. Um, in terms of assets, um, the, if we look, I'm going to grab my, uh, my pen here. If we look at the average five-year pre-tax profit, for the industry was 10.3%, and you can see for the most part, these well exceeded that 10.3% level. So again, we're looking at low cost providers, maximum profitability. Um, debt to equity, again, I mentioned it can be very debt intensive, 45%. Uh, only one of these companies comes close to having that level of debt. Uh, interest co coverage, uh, the average in the industry was 11 times, so earnings covered interest payments 11 times. Uh, they all exceeded that uh, pretty well. Um, and then the 10-year and five-year earnings growth, uh, here's where you just see all sorts of variations. Some of these companies had not been around for 10 years. Uh, some of them had uh, minimal growth. Some of them had growth that was all over the place. Uh, and then finally, the dividend yield, 1.2% uh, on average. These are not significant dividend plays. However, some of them didn't pay dividends. Some of them had uh, dividends that were a little bit higher. Uh, so uh, I'm going to flip over to my toolkit. And uh, then we'll take a look at uh, these companies uh, very quickly. We'll run through them uh, and just talk about them just a little bit. Uh, this is uh, Caledonia Mining. So very small business, $75 million in uh, revenue last year. So that's uh, a, a, a very, very small uh, business uh, but you can see uh, actually profitable every year in the last decade except for 2013 uh, and um, uh, increasing you know kind of gently over time uh, revenues on an annualized basis up 7.6 percent including 2013 if we take that out it's 8.1 percent uh, earnings growth 16.5 percent over the last 10 years so again we look at this on the SSG we would say yeah okay uh, I mean it's not the most attractive uh, graph uh, and the last two quarters have not been as strong on the earnings side. However, things are generally moving in the right place. And if we think of, uh, but we're not seeing the impact of the recession uh, in 2008, 2009. So um, uh, if we flip back to the second page, you can see, again, uh, margins just kind of all over the place, but going up, the pre-tax margins increasing. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've got a, a 2013 outlier year, uh, but we see uh, as we get into 2019, the margins actually increase nicely, but I expect those to, to come back down. Um, PE ratios, uh, these are super low. <laughs> You'll see much uh, higher PE ratios, uh, but these actually kind of fit into an SSV model where the selected high PE ratio, the average high is 8.5. Uh, uh, in the last 52 weeks, it's been as high as 15, um, as low as 3.3. Uh, in 2019, you know, we could, if we struck out some outliers here, like that 2.3 or the 1.3, um, you know, that would actually provide a little bit better um, um, uh, results for us as we go forward. Um, so everything kind of, you know, kind of fits. Um, also, we'll pay attention to the percentage payout. Um, and again, m my note for you is when we're looking at percentage payouts, uh, sometimes you're going to see these companies have payouts that exceed their earnings. Again, if it's a bad year, they're not going to cut the dividend, uh, but they're going to make up for it the next year. So it's really important to focus on the average. You know, so I think you can, in a, in a typically up year, they're paying about 30% of earnings as a dividend. So that's something that's very sustainable. 
Um, so that's Caledonia. Um, my next, uh, uh, I'm gonna quickly, uh, there's my BT. Uh, I'll do, do them out kind of alphabetically here. Uh, uh, so this is uh, BT, B2 Gold uh, Corp. Uh, and again, uh, really focusing on long-term trends. If you look, so everything from 2013 to 2018, uh, I thought was, you know, where things were really kind of going down. But to get a sense of, you know, 11% growth over the long term, what that might look like um, for this particular company. Um, and again, we're focused on long-term to long-term kinds of trends. Um, and uh, margins again, uh, margins went up significantly, but they were starting out uh, from below zero, you know, so kind of all over the place um, as you're looking at this particular company um, and not necessarily in the buy zone, slightly higher yield uh, that they just started paying a dividend. Um, and again, you know, P ratios just kind of all over the place, uh, but kind of normalizing as they've uh, seemed to have matured last year with revenues just over a billion dollars. Uh, uh, Franco Nevada is, this is one of the big royalty companies, one of the best known. Um, revenue is only $844 million. You can see the kind of seesaw, whipsaw uh, event uh, or, or aspect of their earnings and um, uh, earnings and profits uh, over the last decade. Uh, but this is uh, largely held out as one of the, the top uh, of the royalty streaming businesses. Um, uh, I thought I had the description there. Um, so you can see, again, lot, not a whole lot of consistency, but um, moving in the right direction. Uh, and again, their margins, again, flopping around along as earnings do, but are higher last year than any point in the last decade. So uh, there's something to be said for that. As prices go up, uh, you're gonna see uh, probably a little better increase in their profitability of the royalty companies. Uh, so again, uh, kind of um, more realistic, or not very realistic, rather, uh, PE ratios. Uh, and again, but we're not normalizing this against typical operating companies that we look at. So I'm really just kind of, uh, we kind of figure, well, um, look at them from the aspect of, um, uh, uh, you know, what, are there trends in place? Um, we're not correlating earnings growth to PE ratios or revenue growth to PE ratio. So what would those uh, what would those PE ratios look like uh, uh, going forward? What might we expect them to be? Uh, and recognize that in the last 52 weeks, the PE has been as high as 148 on a trailing basis and, and as low as 68. So when we look at 146 and 57, uh, that's very realistic according to uh, the last year when the earnings uh, jumped up, uh, prices performed very well. So those are some of the things we're gonna take a look at there. Um, Kirkland Gold is one of the biggest of the producers that I um, that, that uh, kind of looked good to me. And again, more of an SSG that looks like a mature uh, growth business, uh, but again, uh, downturn in 2012 but and 2015 but recovering since that time uh and 1.3 billion dollars uh of revenue last year for first couple of quarters look okay uh and the um on the on page two yeah that profit margin has just uh, uh really zoomed up in 2019. um p ratios for this company more what we would expect from uh, a little more mature growth company with uh, um, you know between 22 and nine roughly. Um, so again, you can justify it, I think, on the uh, stock selection guide and the you know the tiny yield, very sustainable. Uh, they could increase their dividends if they if they uh, wish to. Uh, so that one looked kind of attractive as well. Uh, Predium Resources is next on my list, another one of the miners. So a gold mining business, uh, newer business, uh, publicly traded in 2012. So, you know, pretty much everything until 2017 was, uh, you know, not in growth mode, 
But again, kind of interesting. All right, so they went public, they raised capital, they started their operation, and now they maybe have hit their stride uh, and are producing uh, good timing, prices going up, so maybe they've got their uh, uh, the path laid out ahead of them. Uh, on the valuation side for this company, again, higher PE ratios, as you would expect, declining a little bit uh, in the last 52 weeks, but uh, pretty much uh, near a 52-week high uh, right now. Uh, not too far below it. Uh, so uh, good interest in this particular company. No dividend, but, uh, you know, and again, I'm not equal normalizing these PE ratios relative to uh, the broader market or to other types of growth stocks, but relative to its history and how investors have treated it uh, since it started uh, becoming profitable in 2018. Uh, then uh, we've got two more royalty streaming companies. Uh, one is Royal Gold. Uh, so again, um, you'll notice that the royalty companies have less variation from year to year than the mining stocks do. Uh, again, part of that is diversification. Uh, part of that is um, uh, you know the the fact that they are uh, investing uh, you know a set amount. Their costs don't go up. Uh, once they've made their investment, their costs don't go up. So the gold they get, um, they can sell it and have a higher profit margin uh, than the miners uh, might be able to. So uh, a little more, a uh, little more uh, volatility in the profit margin side of things. But um, still, uh, when they do well, they do very well. When they don't do well, they, uh, you know, like in 2018, uh, they don't do well. Uh, P ratios again much higher uh, between 20 and 50 kind of uh, in the last 52 weeks. Um, so um, maybe a little more richly uh, priced. Uh, and again, you'll see negative uh, payout ratios uh, for some years as they maintain the dividend, but uh, uh, they don't have the earnings to cover it. Uh, but as they've matured, uh, maybe that's going to change a little bit. Uh, and then finally, Sandstorm Gold, which is uh, the last selection, a royalty company. And again, yeah, the trend looks looks not so great on the earning side. Uh, but again, this is a tiny business. So $89 million in revenue last year. Uh, total, uh, uh, yeah, minimal debt, uh, margins, uh, you know, kind of all over the place as well. Uh, PE ratios uh, in the last 52 weeks between 83 and 265, uh, but the average closer to you know uh, 70 to 37 or 40 or something like that. Um, so, um, and this one probably uh, uh, on the overvalued side, this is probably one of the more speculative plays, uh, but in that royalty, uh, royalty uh, mining group, uh, you might take a look at. So uh, again, just kind of running through those companies um, on the list there. Uh, some of them look more attractive. Some of them look more like stocks that we understand on the SSG. Uh, but again, my advice is, yeah, don't get hung up on those PE ratios uh, so much uh, because th this segment is being looked at by investors in a different way. And it's more akin to true cyclical stocks, uh, which uh, if, the best time to buy a true cyclical stock is when its P ratio is high relative to its history, because that means its earnings are at the low point uh, and are likely to expand as the recession concludes and the expansion mode of the economy takes over, then the earnings will go back up again and the PE ratio will start to come down even as the price goes up. Uh, so uh, gold stocks have that characteristic as well. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're looking at those particular companies. Uh, Christian asks, uh, do these lend themselves for investment club investing or is it similar to REITs? Yes, these stocks would be fine in an investment club. Uh, again, because there's no additional Additional consideration uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, tax consequences of the miners, uh, the mining companies. Then uh, I don't think you're going to get uh, hammered like with with a REIT or with master limited partnerships. Um, again, we we have been cautioning clubs for years. We've seen them buying ETFs that actually own the underlying commodity. Uh, so you can buy an ETF that actually owns physical gold. 
Uh, so part of the expense ratio is the storage of that gold in a secure facility. And there, there are facilities, you know, all over the country that provide storage services for gold and other precious metals. Uh, but the, the issue with that is that you've got to file separate uh, forms on your tax returns uh, as a, a collectible. And we don't support that in our tax printer. So if you buy those type, if your club buys those types of ETFs, then you've got to, to prepare additional forms by hand. So your treasurer gets uh, some extra bonus fun time at tax season, which is why we suggest staying away from them. But as individuals, it's not a problem. And the gold miners are not a problem as well. All right, well, uh, thanks for, uh, for attending. Uh, Becky asks if there'll be a link to the recording, and yes, we will archive this session. It is being recorded. Uh, Stephen mentions that the seems the Dow and the S&P should be lower with all the confusion and issues. Uh, do you think these numbers are real or should we be looking for a downturn? I'm always looking for a downturn. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, I was on record in February uh, in San Diego when I gave a, a, a um, uh, when I gave a presentation there that uh, I was predicting a, a recession and a bear market. Um, but I do that every time I present because we're always going to have a recession in a bear market. Uh, the question is, when is it going to happen? <clears throat> These are uncertain times. And uh, this is, you know, the, 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 the bear market, the recovery out of the bear market, the recession, the recovery out of the recession are all going to be largely unpredictable. Um, the problem with the economy coming out of the 2008 2009 uh, recession has been to, in my view that it's it's a uh, a very uh, splotchy recovery and that some segments would, were doing very well others not so well uh, there are lots of forces on the global economy restrictions on on global trade uh, etc uh, that have impacted uh, the expansion mode of American business and the American economy. Um, and so those, those factors, uh, you know, confuse the issue. But um, even so, um, I'm, I'm looking to, uh, I'm looking for a, a six, a four to six quarter uh, recession before things start to kick in uh, and the GDP starts to go up again, which would put us, uh, in, in the end of 2021, um, but there are so many uh, variables that go into it that it, it's really very difficult to make a prediction. Uh, as always, my advice is if you're concerned about a downturn, um, either you know turn off the TV and uh, stop looking at your portfolio so much and just think about where things are going to be in 2024, 2025, uh, where uh, many of your companies will have doubled in size by that point. And if they've doubled in size, they're going to be selling at it significantly more than they are right now, even if they if they uh, lose some ground in the next year or two, uh, they could still recover well. And um, uh, by you know 2024, 2025, 2026, um, these companies are going to be back. Uh, back in shape, uh, and so uh, that is um, that is just part and parcel with our approach. Uh, the Better Investing uh, team on social media posted a quote from uh, Ken Janke, who was a longtime president and CEO of uh, NEIC Better Investing, and he commented that you know the best way to manage risk is to realize that uh, there's no such thing as a market top; it's only a temporary position, and then uh, you know the market's going to find a new top um, and it's going to continue to go to 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 drive forward uh, i often in my presentations uh, point out that the market always wants to get bigger uh, and so it will find ways to do that so i'm not concerned about a downturn in the in the you know i, I expect volatility i'm prepared for volatility uh, i'm looking forward forward to more of it uh, as we uh, as we head into the last quarter of 2020. Uh, so, um, uh, but again, by the, you know, the, the, who knows what's going to happen? We've got a big presidential election coming up in two months, uh, less than two months. Um, that could have an impact on uh, the optimism or pessimism of the country. Uh, we have um, 
um, the next quarter as it comes in. Uh, I think a lot of people were surprised that the second quarter wasn't the bloodbath uh, that had been expected in terms of a lot of the, the fundamental results of many companies and how nimbly so many companies were able to pivot to so, you know to keep their business going. Um, so uh, I think by and large, we tend to be optimists and, and look for the, the good to come out of it. Uh, Steven asks, how much uh, gold do I own? Uh, right now, I am not, uh, I don't own any of these gold stocks. However, uh, I am, we are looking at some of them uh, in our small cap uh, newsletter as a, as a possible idea. Uh, I've been hearing, it's interesting because I, I had been hearing from investment clubs that were looking at gold or that had made the decision earlier this year to buy some gold when things started to go south in the market and the economy. And, uh, you know, we're feeling very, very pleased with that decision and wanted to know how come uh, we weren't uh, covering it a little, little more broadly uh, and then when the opportunity came up with the money show i thought yeah this is a good this is a good educational topic one way or the other and i was surprised at some of the results and some of the things that i learned as well so uh, that's the intention of sharing it with you all today so uh more and more events coming up still um, and the advantage of these are all uh, going to be uh, cyber events uh, and the advantage there is that you might be able to participate no matter where you are around the country so if you kind of look on the better investing website at some of these events or follow us on uh, follow me on social media uh, e-money show is adding more virtual events uh, i've got events for the dallas and the puget sound chapter and perhaps the san francisco chapter uh coming up um uh later this year uh, so we're going to continue to try to to spread the word and support the education of our members. So as always, keep calm and stay the course. Um, we'll see you next month in October with our next Lunchtime Stock Club. Uh, so wish you all the best. We'll talk to you then.